Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to, um, to thank you for coming here and also a big thank you to everybody who are joining us from home via the web streaming. We are hoping today to be able to reach up to a million people and so we know that initially people won't be watching it straight away but we're hoping that people will share the link to the web stream and that we can get this message out because it's such an important message and it's a life changing message and I can say that from my own personal experience because I myself was diagnosed with diabetes in 2012 and it came to me as a huge shock because I didn't meet any of the criteria that you would have expected for somebody to have um, diabetes and I did my own research and I realized that the um, the advice that I was given was not the best advice and I, I created my own advice and I through, through looking at testimonials and lots of research from different doctors and I completely and utterly changed my diet and pretty much followed long before I knew Asim but I, I pretty much followed his Piopi diet without knowing what it was and, um, and I, I remember going to see my doctor afterwards and my HbA1c that's the average level of your blood sugars had gone from here it had just dropped massively <clears throat> And my doctor was so impressed because I'd obviously followed all the advice that they'd given and I'd taken all of the drugs that they'd given me. And I was able to say, well, actually, no, I, I haven't taken the metformin in, in months and I, and I don't follow the advice that you've given me and this is what I'm doing. And, and all of a sudden it was, oh, no, 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 I don't think that that's why your blood sugars have dropped. And so I know that we can be the masters of our own destiny. We do not have to follow like a bunch of sheep what we are told and the beauty of the internet is that not only are people from around the world able to watch us live what we're saying today but also they can do their own research and they can find out for themselves and we're not saying to you take our advice just on face value what we're saying is find out for yourself do your own research and if you want to know for a surety of whether what we're saying is true try it out and you'll be amazed because I was amazed I am um, convinced that what we need to do now is change the government's approach and it needs to be a top-down change because it's all well and good a million people changing their diets for themselves and finding out what needs to be done but every single day hundreds of people are diagnosed with type 2 and type 1 diabetes. This is the epidemic of our time and unless the government is given valid and current and sensible advice, then I'm afraid that a lot of the preventable illnesses and diseases and effects of diabetes, which could be um, avoided, are going to happen to people unnecessarily. So what we're hoping is to put pressure on the people that actually make a difference and the people that can, can change this advice. And I am so proud to be able to, um, to welcome somebody who I have known for a couple of years now. I'm highly impressed by him. I'm sure you all will be as well. Dr. Asim Malhotra. Now, he is a vanguard. He has, of himself, uh, stood up against the big pharmaceutical, big food industry and the lobbyists, and he has risen his head above the parapet, which for those of you who have ever done that, it is not easy. It's a hard thing to do. I have a great deal of respect for you. I know how hard it is, but that's another story. We're talking about food here, not politics. And um, I know how hard it is. And he is somebody who has, um, has really taken upon himself to, to try and improve the health of our nation. And he's now going to introduce our panel, and we're going to kick off. So with no further ado, Dr. Asim Malhatra. Thank you, thank you, Nathan, and thank. Uh, I'm, I'm going to stand um, when I speak. I just prefer to stand. I think it will be uh, you'll get my message more effectively if I'm standing up. But um, I'm, I'm really honoured to be here. Thank you for inviting me to speak today, uh, really to spread a message of, uh, of something I believe is very important that affects every one of us, if not us individually, it affects our relatives, our friends, our families. 
and I'm particularly honoured to have some really great people joining me today who are going to speak as well. So I'll start on my left-hand side. I've got um, Sarah Macklin, who is a, uh, an eminent nutritionist from Britain, described by Marie Claire as the um, Jamie Oliver of the modelling world, uh, and she'll be speaking to you a little bit later on. Um, on, my, on the right of Nathan is uh, Professor Hanno Pell from uh, University of Leiden, who is a diabetologist and probably one of the most published and eminent uh, respected diabetolog diabetologists, in, in, I would say, in the world. And on his right is uh, somebody who's become a very good friend of mine in the last few years, uh, Sir Richard Thompson, who was a personal physician to the Queen of England for 21 years and the past president of the Royal College of Physicians. So uh, I'm really pleased that they are, are here today to really support um, you know, what I believe will be ultimately a very positive message at the end of this whole session of what we can actually do to really improve people's health uh, and revolutionise healthcare. So I'm going to start with... Um, a quote from the late, great Stephen Hawking. And I often tell my patients, you know, for me and this, this whole journey that I've been on, it's been about um, the people that inspire me more than anybody else are my own patients. And I'm always learning from them. And I think the day we stop learning as doctors is the day we stop actually becoming proper doctors. So I think that we, we need to approach a lot of this, you know, there's a lot of evolving science, but we need to constantly have an open mind. So as a doctor... I wish to practice evidence-based medicine. And this slide shows you what the real components, the most important components of evidence-based medicine are. And that is using our individual clinical expertise, as you can see, the best available clinical evidence. So last but not least, what's most important is patient preferences and values. And it's something I think we don't actually do enough of, and we are neglecting to a huge amount. And uh, and through this talk, hopefully that will make a lot more sense to you. And for the very purpose, ultimately, to, to improve patients' outcomes, to improve their health. So, the man who's considered the father of the evidence-based medicine movement, Professor David Sackett, said, half of what you learn in medical school will show to be either dead wrong or out of date within five years of your graduation. The trouble is nobody can tell you which half. <laughs> The most important thing to learn is how to learn on your own. And sadly, I've been a qualified doctor now for almost 17 years. I have slowly and reluctantly come to the conclusion that as it stands now, honest doctors can no longer practice honest medicine. We have a complete healthcare system failure and an epidemic of misinformed doctors and misinformed and harmed patients, based upon a number of factors. So these include bias funding of research, so that's research that's funded because it's likely to be profitable, not beneficial for patients, bias reporting in medical journals, bias patient pamphlets, bias reporting the media, commercial conflicts of interest, and last but not least, medical curricula that fail to teach doctors how to comprehend and communicate health statistics. So let me give you a few examples. So financial conflicts of interest and a culture to do more can often lead to a lot of unnecessary tests and investigations and put that in head, in, ahead of what's the most important to patients. For a minority, greed smothers the conscience. So one US cardiologist was jailed for ordering $19 million worth of unnecessary investigations and procedures. In the United States, they have a fee-for-service model, which incentivizes people to do more, um, tr give more treatments and, and do more investigations because they're paid for it. In the UK, we have something called payment by results, but in reality, although it's not to the same degree as the United States, effectively, that's the same sort of thing that's going on. So let me just give you one example here. Um, so I, I trained as an interventional cardiologist, so essentially... Having done cardiology, I subspecialized where I was doing, in layman's terms, keyhole heart surgery on patients. And I've done thousands of angiograms where you diagnose people with coronary artery disease from, a, from this uh, in, in procedure. But also we do something called stents. Now, many of you may know of stents. Essentially, it's a procedure where we unblock people's arteries by passing a tube into the arteries and inflating a balloon and, and deploying a small metal scaffold. But the reality is that although it's life-saving for people having a heart attack, and I'll tell you exactly how life-saving that is later, for people who are not having a heart attack, people who have stable heart disease, 
it does not prevent heart attacks or prolonged life. And we have very good extensive evidence for many, many years that it doesn't do that. But it's estimated in America almost half of all the procedures for stents on many, many patients costing millions and millions of dollars actually um, you know, is carried out is of questionable value despite this body of evidence. But most importantly, 88% of patients undergoing the procedure thought they were having the procedure for the very purpose for which it doesn't benefit them. And when anonymously asked, 43% of cardiologists said they would still go ahead and do the procedure even if they felt it would not benefit the patient. Now, this is not a procedure that doesn't come with harms. So at the end of uh, uh, mid-2013, and then following on several months later, uh, I wrote two consecutive editorials by coincidence. The first one was in the BMJ, uh, called Too Much Angioplasty, and the second one was in JAMA Internal Medicine. And the first article I wrote was actually pegged on the fact that I was emphasizing this level of misinformation actually no one is immune to. In fact, it probably, in this case, went all the way up to the former president of the United States, George Bush. So it was widely reported in America that George Bush received a stent for heart disease. However, apparently, he had been cycling um, 100 miles the week before. There was no report that he'd had a heart attack. And as far as we know, he just went for a routine check under his cardiologist and ended up with a heart stent. And my guess is this, that President, ex-President Bush probably wasn't told it wasn't going to prevent him having a heart attack or prolong his life. So I basically wrote an editorial saying that actually we need to be more explicit with patients and emphasize the importance of lifestyle changes and medications that can help prevent heart attacks. But certainly this procedure, um, you know, the, there isn't fully informed consent because the actual procedure itself um, does carry a risk, a 1% risk of having a heart attack, stroke or death. And in my career, I've seen patients that unfortunately have suffered a complication that couldn't be predicted, where they've either had a stroke on the table or they've died. And I thought to myself, wow, this patient's symptoms weren't that severe, yet if they'd probably been left alone and hadn't had the procedure, they'd still be alive today. Or they may have changed the decision-making process about if they were informed about the actual true benefits of the procedure, they may have changed their mind, not had it done, and still be alive. So, um, you know, I, I emphasize that we should actually make this mandatory in the consent form to protect patients from these unnecessary harms. And uh, the second editor on John Maternal Medicine was really re-emphasizing re that. It was press released and picked up by BBC News. And uh, interestingly, uh, the um, chairman of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges the, the body in the UK that represents almost every doctor agreed with me, said this was a legitimate concern uh, in, in the press release. Um, the British Cardiovascular Intervention Society, interestingly, run by cardiologists who do heart stents, um, their response was um, they didn't think that changing the consent form uh, was actually the best way to manage this problem, which I thought was very interesting. But clearly there is a, a bias there. What I didn't predict is several months later, JAMA Internal Medicine then published a paper where they actually gave this scenario to patients to see whether it would change the decision-making process. And it actually did significantly. When patients were told there wasn't a benefit from stenting for stable disease in preventing a heart attack, stroke, or death, they um, changed their decision-making process, reducing the amount of people taking a, having a stent by about 25%. And it was estimated if this conversation was to go on, just a very simple, transparent conversation across the United States with cardiologists and their patients, then reducing the amount of unnecessary t uh, treatments would, would, would potentially save U.S. healthcare $864 million a year just from one conversation about one particular procedure. Okay, so misunderstanding of health statistics is also a major risk factor for misinformation. So many doctors, surprisingly, don't understand health statistics and therefore cannot evaluate evidence for and against a treatment. So in one study several years ago of 150 gynecologists, a third did not actually understand the meaning of a 25% risk reduction from mammography screening, so screening for breast cancer. Most of that third believed that if all women were screened, 250 out of 1,000 less would die of breast cancer. But actually, when you look at the data, you'd have to screen 2,000 women to prevent one death from detecting and saving them from breast cancer. So one out of 2,000 is actually the actual figure. And a smaller study that was carried out a few years later, despite this awareness, although many of the, uh, the doctors asked knew about the benefit not being that great, none of them were aware of the harm. So for every one lady that was saved from breast cancer from screening, 10 were harmed 
by receiving an unnecessary treatment or an operation. So let me just give you a very basic, simple mathematical uh, education on statistics here. And it's not rocket science, and this is a crucial part. So there are many ways of actually presenting uh, a benefit, a relative risk or absolute risk, also known as the numbers needed to treat NNT. So if you communicate relative risks, as opposed to NNT or absolute risk, it can actually lead lay people to, and doctors also to uh, overestimate the benefits of a treatment. So let me give you an example. For people with type 2 diabetes, the published literature, published medical literature, tells us that if you take a torvastatin, a cholesterol-lowering drug, 10 milligrams every day for four years, there's a 48% relative risk reduction in having a stroke. That sounds quite impressive. You're 48% less likely to have a stroke if you take 10 milligrams of torvastatin every day for four years. But what does that actually mean when you look at the data? Well, it means you reduce the risk of having a stroke from having no treatment, no statin, from 28 in 1,000 to 15 in 1,000, which means there's an absolute risk reduction of 1.3%. So what does that mean for the individual in real terms? The actual way to say to that patient is if you take a torvastatin 10 milligrams every day for four years, there's a 1 in 77 chance that the drug will prevent you having a stroke. Very different to 48% relative risk reduction. Most people do not benefit. The benefits are small, but you may decide that that benefit is good for you, or you may decide it's not. It's very different. Now, mismatch framing in medical journals that we rely on to give us information about benefits and harms of medications has made the situation worse. So if treatment A reduces the risk of developing a disease from 10 to 7 in 1,000, but increases the risk of the harm from 7 to 10 in 1,000, the journal article will pre present the benefits as a 30% relative risk benefit or reduction, but the harms are 0.3% when they're exactly the same thing. How common is this? Well, one analysis looking at um, articles, a third of articles, in fact, published in the BMJ, JAMA, and the Lancet between 2004 and 2006, use mismatch framing when presenting information on the benefits of a drug and the harms. It's extraordinary. This is not science. This is marketing. And this asymmetric presentation of, obviously, benefits and harms is, was going to lead to overtreatment. It's going to exaggerate the benefits of a medication and reduce the risks, or, or the, the, the perceived risks. And by the way, this is all still best-case scenario. I'm going to go further deeper into this as well shortly. So don't just take my word for it. The man considered probably the world-leading research in health literacy in Berlin, Gerd Gigerenza, he said in a World Health Organization bulletin in 2009, it is an ethical imperative that every doctor and patient understand the difference between absolute and relative risks to protect patients against unnecessary anxiety and manipulation. In other words, and this is what I believe to be true, unless you have this conversation with a patient, unless your doctor tells you the absolute benefit of a drug you're going to take, then it's not being ethical. I think this is unethical practice. That's essentially what Gerd Gigerenza is saying. But we are unwittingly practicing unethical medicine. Most doctors want to do the right thing, but they're misinformed. Let me give you a case study. People like case studies are interesting, interesting stories that kind of tell you a lot of different interesting things about what we're speaking about today. So I saw a patient, a 48-year-old man, had type 2 diabetes. He'd been seen in outpatients several months after having a heart attack. He'd received a, a stent. He'd survived. And he was put on a cocktail of medications. And he comes back to see me in clinic, and he's re reporting very disabling chest pain. Now, as a cardiologist, if you've had a patient who's had a heart attack and had a stent, and there's often sometimes some other underlying disease there, you worry either has a stent blocked off as a new disease. But the history, most importantly, didn't suggest anything serious. But just to be on the safe side, we decided to book him for a repeat angiogram to look at his arteries and check things are OK. There was clearly not having a heart attack, but there may have been a new blockage that was causing him problems. So we booked him for an angiogram. I did the angiogram. I looked at his arteries. Everything was fine. It was very reassuring. And I said to him at the end of the procedure, listen, everything's OK. There's nothing wrong with the heart. This could be coming from your stomach. Because he said, well, doc, that's great. But why have I still got this pain? What am I going to do? I said, this could be coming from your stomach. Sometimes chest pain um, can be coming from the you know, acid reflux. So we put him on some medications and said, go back to your GP, your general practitioner, and we'll follow you up and, and see how you get on. So he was reassured, put on this pump proton pump inhibitor drug. He comes back six weeks later, arranged to see him, and he said, listen, 
this pain is still there, it's getting worse. I've also got these other things I didn't mention before. I've also got these muscle aches and I'm feeling fatigued. He was with his wife who was also very worried because he's now depressed and she says he's been depressed now for months because of these pains, disabling pains that he's got. I spoke to one of my colleagues and he said, oh, look at his medications, maybe it's something in the medications. Maybe it's a statin. I thought, well, that's interesting. Statin causing these side effects? Okay. So I said to him, listen, we're going to stop your statin for a couple of weeks, go back to your GP and see what happens. Now, what's happened in the meantime is GP has already referred him to a gastroenterologist. So he's now about to go and get a, because the, the drug that he took for his so-called chest pain that was thought to be maybe coming from the stomach wasn't helping him. So he's now about to go and have an endoscopy. So an invasive investigation where he's going to have a telescope camera passed into his stomach to look for an ulcer. So this is being organized. I can't see him just because obviously, you know, the way things work, it's, it's a non-urgent case. So, you know, I arranged to see him a few months later, but he turns up uninvited. A week later, he turns up to the clinic, knowing that I'm in clinic, and he knocks on the door and he comes in. And he says, thank you, doctor. After months of misery, I've stopped his statin. My pain has disappeared, but now I'm worried. My GP has said, you must never stop your statin or you will die. Okay, now I want to ask the audience here, does anyone have any idea roughly what his risk of death is? So he's taken a statin, he's had a heart attack, there's evidence based that statins are beneficial to people with heart disease. But what do you think his risk of death is from stopping a statin for two weeks? That may have been causing side effects, he's had a heart attack. Any guess here, in terms of percentage figures here, what do you think? One in 100, one in 50, one in 10, any guesses from the audience? Anyone that hasn't heard me say this before? <laughs> Go ahead. Zero. Okay, zero. Well, maybe you know something I don't. Um, Probably, probably very close to zero, probably worst case scenario based upon the published evidence, one in 10,000. So this chap's risk of death for stopping a statin for two weeks is one in 10,000. Yet the GP has said, you must never stop your statin or you could die. Okay, so clearly there's, there's an issue there. Now, in 2000 and the end of 2013, there was a, a controversy that started because there was um, calls that were coming from various quarters of academia suggesting we should expand the use of statin drugs to more people taking it, essentially healthy people, which in effect would reduce the threshold for prescription of statins based upon people's risk factors and ultimately lead to suggesting every person, every adult over the age of 50 should take a statin drug. So John Abramson from Harvard and colleagues did an analysis of, all, of data that was already published, by the way, most of it all industry sponsored, to actually see whether there was any benefit in terms of reducing death rates in people at low risk of heart disease. And in the editorial they said that there was no mortality benefit, in other words you will not live one day longer from taking a statin, but also he suggested actually we should be concentrating more on lifestyle changes, 80% of heart disease is related to lifestyle, diet, exercise, that kind of thing, smoking reduction. And, uh, but. Uh, by coincidence, in the, same, in the same paper, in the same uh, journal of the BMJ, I also wrote an editorial which was called Saturated Fat is Not the Major Issue. And that, was, that editorial was press released by the BMJ and became a big news story. It was front page of three newspapers. It went all around the world, essentially because a cardiologist is coming out and saying, God forbid, saturated fat that we think clogs the arteries actually doesn't clog the arteries at all. The data doesn't support that. And if we should be turning our attention to sugar. But in the same editorial... I also mentioned the fact that we've overprescribed statins to millions of people because there was no benefit for low risk. And the side effects, based upon some observational studies and my own experience, is probably affecting one in five people. Now, the side effects are unacceptable, essentially, to patients. But there was a backlash a few months later. So this got a lot of attention. The saturated fat was the main story. But a few months later... Professor Sir Rory Collins of Oxford University, considered probably the leading statin researcher in the world, who has done lots of drug trials on statins, um, he came out and uh, in the front page of the Guardian newspaper in March 2014, several months after the papers were published, he basically called for retraction of both John Abramson's paper, John Abramson said the same thing about side effects that I did, um, and said that this could cause you know, unnecessary deaths of people stopping their statins from fear-mongering. It's interesting, he said that you know, the serious side effects are very rare and essentially that you know, the, the, these, these symptoms are, are very, very rare. You know, from our data, we don't have any evidence of any significant side effects. So ultimately what ended up happening was this then got, um, it went for a review. There was a lot of pressure on the editor of the BMJ, Fiona Godley, 
And I think rightly so, that she decided to send this, these both articles for review to see whether they should be retracted by an independent panel. While this was going on, in the interim, NICE, National Institute of Clinical Excellence, our health watchdog, interestingly, <laughs> came out and decided that we should be giving statins to more people and we should prescribe them to low risk, which will ultimately result in um, GPs being financially incentivized to prescribe statins to people at low risk of heart disease, despite the fact there was no mortality benefit. The non-mortality benefits at best were about 1 in 140 of preventing a non-fatal heart attack or stroke. So they came out, but there was a response. Um, actually, a number of doctors, eminent doctors, including Sir Richard, who is here, Richard Thompson here today, the former chair of the, uh, of the Royal College of, of General Practitioners, a number of other doctors, wrote a letter to the Secretary of State for Health and the chair of NICE to say, actually, we think this is not a very good idea. We think it will ultimately cause more harm than good. And we gave a number of reasons in a very extended document. I was also a co-signatory, saying that basically all of the guidance on statins was based upon industry-sponsored studies, which is a crucial uh, element of all of this. The side effects weren't taken into account, including type 2 diabetes. We know statins do cause type 2 diabetes in probably about 1% of people. And most importantly, there's a mortality benefit. These patients are not going to live one day longer. So mass prescription of statins ultimately we thought would actually put more pressure on the system and wasn't a good idea. So this actually got a lot of attention. It became a big news story. And uh, this was while this whole uh, review panel thing was going on. And uh, the review panel came back 6-0 in our favour, saying there was no reason for retraction. There maybe was a minor correction that needs to be made about the quality of study that was used to make this claim about 20% side effects. And that should have been the end of it. Also, the General Practitioners Committee backed us as well, because they said that because we don't have access to all the raw data on statins, and also based upon the fact that the UK stockpiled um, Tamiflu, which we spent half a billion pounds on, on a drug that ultimately, when independent researchers were able to access the data, revealed was no better than paracetamol for helping people for influenza, until we get the access to the raw data, um, we actually, as general practitioners, the ultimate committee that would help decide, make these recommendations, they revolt, this is unprecedented, against the health watchdog. Um, the other issue as well that I didn't mention is that NICE, the panel who were involved in making decisions or recommendations, several members of the panel had direct financial ties to the drug companies manufacturing statins. So again, we felt this was a bias. Now, this, the, the saga continued, it didn't stop there, uh, and I'm going to jump forward because I know we don't have a lot of time, but essentially, what ended up happening then is uh, Professor Collins then referred, he was not happy, there was no retraction. Professor Collins, who felt very strongly that there was an over-exaggeration of the benefits, uh, of, the, of the harms of statins from side effects, he referred the editor of the BMJ to the Committee of Publication Ethics for editorial misconduct, which some people felt, if she was found guilty, would have resulted in her sacking, and it may well have done. Luckily, that didn't happen. But... After this, The Lancet then published a paper basically suggesting that we've now done a reanalysis with the same researchers who suggested statins are great, including Professor Saru Collins, who's one of the lead authors, to say that actually, no, statins are great, there's no issue of side effects really, it's very little, and uh, overall the benefits outweigh the harms even in low risk. The Sunday Times does an investigation about a month after that was published in The Lancet, so John, um, John and God Thomas. And what he found was really interesting, and I think, you know, it's certainly, certainly puzzling to me. So he mentions Professor Collins' work where they'd then come to the conclusion maybe one in 50, one in 100 people may suffer muscle symptoms from statins, although it's reversible, and that's true. Um, Professor Collins, who also believes more people should be taking statins, is a co-inventor of a test that identifies susceptibility to muscle pain from statins. That's interesting. The test, which was branded as Statin Smart, was sold direct to the consumer for $99 on a website that claims 29% of statin users will, will suffer muscle pain, weakness, or cramps. And the marketing material also claims that 58% of patients on statins stop taking them within a year, mostly because of muscle pain. And that's true. When you ask patients why they stop their statins, most of them stop them within a year. They say because they get muscle pain and symptoms. Royalties from licensing of the patent can be used to fund university research, but Professor Collins waived his personal fees. And Boston Heart Diagnostics, interestingly, that they stood by their claim. They had the license on the, uh, on the actual test. 
And they said that randomized controlled trials, such as those used in the Lancet study um, authored by Collins, had major limitations because patients with statin intolerance were often excluded. So that's part of the problem, is the actual trials don't reflect a lot of patients who must suffer muscle symptoms, partly because in running periods, before the trial starts, people who are non adherent to statins are taken out, probably because of side effects in my view, and also the people in the drug trials themselves often don't represent the people we see in the real world who are on statins, who have lots of different illnesses and may be older, for example. John Unger Thomas then did a Freedom of Information request to find out whether Oxford University and, the, and Rory, Professor Rory Collins' department had received any money from the sale of this test that tells you whether you like to get muscle symptoms from statins by testing for a gene. And what he found was, yes, they had received, University of Oxford had received over £300,000 for the sale of this, and Professor Collins' department had received over £150,000. And this, um, this thing that he invented, a co-inventor, he was a co-inventor on, actually uh, came to fruition in 2009. 2009. So I'm puzzled by this. If the side effects so, are so rare, my question is, why would you invent something to test for side effects and make money out of it, or your department make money out of it? I'll let you draw your own conclusions. So let's just take a step back for a second. You know, the, there is a system failure here. There's a bigger picture, and I think we need to acknowledge something else. Peter Wilmshurst, who's a cardiologist, a very respected cardiologist in the UK, in the Centre of Evidence-Based Medicine in 2014, giving a talk, he points out a few, I think, really important um, points. First of all, pharmaceutical companies and medical device companies have, have a, a legal obligation to make profit and declare a shareholder dividend by selling their product. They are not required although we would believe it to be the case or hope it to be the case, they are not required to sell consumers, patients and doctors, the best treatment. But what he says is the real scandals are this. Regulators fail to prevent misconduct by industry, and doctors, institutions and journals that have responsibilities to patients and scientific integrity collude with industry for financial gain. Peter Wilmsus has just submitted evidence I'm going to talk about briefly now to the Science and Technology Committee in the UK who are investigating research misconduct and scientific integrity. And here are a few key points that gives you a bigger picture issue of why this is a system failure. First of all, academic institutions bear responsibility to publish. So there's pressure to publish for career advancement. And that can result in research misconduct. A record of prominent publication can actually attract future funding, often from drug companies and good publicity, which generates, which institutions obviously like. Other pressures for misconduct come from association with industry. He says some publications are simply organised criminal activities, which may be at the behest of the sponsors, when prominent academics are paid large sums of money to publish false data by industry, or a sponsor may be one of the victims when payments for conducting research are made to the investigators who simply fabricate data. Medical journals have a financial pressure to publish positive findings of research on drugs and medical devices because their manufacturers buy reprints for the papers of distribution of doctors that then pay for advertisements as well linked to articles that are favorable, favorable to their product. So protect, to protect their reputations, academic institutions conceal research misconduct, destroy evidence, and silence whistleblowers. By the way, if you look at the document which is available online, you can find examples of all of this. I'm not going to go through it because I think that would be unfair, but you can find this. Journals are reluctant to admit that they have published flawed research, so they commonly refuse to publish failures to replicate. Fear of libel action contributes to the failure to expose research misconduct. Because lenient sanctions are imposed, institutions believe that the misconduct is not very serious and therefore fraudsters are not deterred. And he says the best way forward really is for criminal action for certain forms of research misconduct, and I agree with him. Now one example here, um, one Dutch researcher in 2011 was found guilty for publishing fictitious data on the use of beta blocker drugs for non-cardiac surgery. Uh, and he was expelled from his institution. But what was very extraordinary is that his, his, his research, many papers were published in, in very high impact journals. He influenced the European Society of Cardiology guidelines. And this research, it's estimated that it resulted 
you know, the, the use of beta blockers where it wasn't indicator ultimately when it was found that this, this, this data was, was uh, dodgy. It's estimated that over Europe, over eight years, across Europe, this was responsible for 800,000 excess deaths. 800,000 excess deaths. Peter Gosher, co-founder of the Cochrane Collaboration, uh, who's done a lot of uh, work in this area around research misconduct, scientific integrity. He uh, wrote a piece in the BMJ not so long ago, he's written a book about this, is actually one of the other issues is the fact that there is a lot of problems of ph major pharmaceutical companies being found guilty for, uh, for fraud, essentially. In the United States in particular, between 2009 and 2014, there was a total of around $14 billion worth of fines paid for illegal marketing of drugs, hiding data and harms, which involved the majority of the top 10 pharmaceutical companies. But the problem is this, is that there is no incentive for them to stop doing this. There doesn't seem to be anything changing the system. And what he says is that if you commit crime and crime pays, you commit more crime. And that's what they are doing. Let's talk about the innovation crisis. We keep hearing about, oh, we need more innovation, more innovation. Well, what innovation have we had in the last couple of decades? Between 2000 and 2008, of the 667 new drugs approved by the FDA, only 11% of them were found to be truly innovative. Most of the other drugs that have been produced have essentially been copies of old ones at great cost and no extra benefit. And perhaps not surprising when drug companies spend at least twice as much on marketing than they do in research and development. So we're not investing enough in research, we're not going to get new blockbusters, are we? The former editor of the New England Journal of Medicine says it's no longer possible to trust, this is the highest impact medical journal in the world, by the way, says it is no longer possible to trust much of the clinical research that is published or rely on the judgment of trusted physicians or authorities of medical guidelines. I take no pleasure in this conclusion, which I reach slowly and reluctantly over my two decades as an editor of the New England Journal of Medicine. That's quite extraordinary. Is she alone as a journal editor? No, she's not. Richard Horton wrote an editorial in 2016, and he said possibly half, according to people that he'd met, senior academics who, who he said will re remain anonymous, possibly half of the published literature may simply be untrue. Because of several recent scandals in British universities, Richard Smith, former editor of the BMJ, also wrote, something is rotten in the state of British medicine and has been for a long time. And he refers to speaking at an event with lots of academics where he asked the audience, how many of you are aware of research misconduct taking place in your career in your institution? And he said about a third to a half put their hand up. A third to a half. He said, how many of you reported it? They all put their hand down. Okay, so, has overemphasis on drugs. And by the way, just to add another uh, really relevant, important piece of information, Professor John Winidis from Stanford University um, a very eminent professor of medicine and statistics, he published a paper recently where he looked at the quality of research that's published in many, many clinical interventions, published in big medical journals, and of the 60,000 interventions, clinical studies that were published, he said only 7% of them fulfill criteria of actually being high quality and relevant to patients. 7%. So, has overemphasis on, on medicine detracted from lifestyle? Absolutely. We, ha we have a major public health crisis, as many of you know, we don't hear, we hear stories about this constantly now, the obesity epidemic in the UK that's now considered the fat man of Europe. More than 60% of the adult population are overweight or obese. This more disturbingly, more, almost a, a third of children are in the same category by the time they leave primary school, and the, and the trends are getting worse. Obesity itself costs the NHS, National Health Service, about £5 billion per year. That's expected to increase. But actually, the bigger issue is type 2 diabetes. So the direct and indirect cost of type 2 diabetes in the UK now is about 20 billion, 20 billion pounds per year, both for treatment of diabetes, NHS costs, and also lost productivity, indirect costs due to lost productivity, so to the economy. And that's predicted to hit 40 billion by 2035 if we do nothing. I think the most important thing, I mean, we'll talk about some of the dietary uh, controversies shortly, but really the, the processed food environment is at the heart, the obesogenic environment is at the heart of this problem. It's become almost unavoidable to avoid sugary processed food wherever you go, whether it's whether you go to the petrol station, whether it's on the high street, whether it's in gyms and health clubs, 
For me and where my journey started and what I find the biggest scandal is that we've even allowed our hospitals to become a branding opportunity for, opportunity for the junk food industry. Several years ago when I started on this campaign, I remember operating on a man in the middle of the night who'd come in with a heart attack. We'd done emergency keyhole heart surgery on him. He did very well in his 50s, a little bit overweight, smoker. The next morning on my ward round, I'm actually telling him, you know, you need to uh, take these pills, including statins religiously. <laughs> I said, you need to stop smoking and you need, to, you need to eat a healthy diet. And just as I'm telling him about following a healthy diet, he gets served a burger and fries by the hospital. And he looks at me and he says, Doc, how do you expect me to change my lifestyle if you're serving me the same crap, pardon my language, that brought me in here in the first place? And I looked around me and I, 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 you know, I've been a very, uh, I would call myself a foodie, if you pardon the term, most of my life. I like eating good food, I love cooking. And I couldn't find any decent food in the hospital I was working at, and in most hospitals. But I also looked around at my, my colleagues. 50% of 1.4 NHS employees are also overweight or obese. That includes doctors and nurses and non-clinical staff, all to the same levels. And really that proves that education is ineffective when the food environment is working against you. But of course, <laughs> there's the illusion of protection. And actually a study showed in JAMA Internal Medicine, where they looked at people at similar risk and followed them up over a number of years, people on statins ended up heavier than people that didn't take statins. And we see that with our patients. But it's not just patients. One professor of cardiology, I won't name, um, I spoke at a conference with him recently, and he's a very eminent, respected professor of cardiology, and he got up on stage and he said, and I thought this was quite funny, he says, if you come from a Seymour Hotra school of preventative medicine, you can prevent heart disease by eating berries and dancing in the woods. It's quite funny, I thought. But then he said, seriously, he said, but if you're like me, pointing to himself, and you can't be bothered doing any exercise, you can take a statin. So he believes that. I'm sure other people believe the same. But, get this. For low risk of people with heart disease, we're talking about the majority of people taking statins worldwide, by the way. And it's estimated that probably close to 100 million people taking statins. Most of those people are not high risk of heart disease. They're not going to live one day longer from taking a statin. There may be a small benefit in preventing a non-fatal event, but overall it's not going to add a single day to their lifespan. Yet most of them don't know this. So I did a little, this is anecdotal of course, a Twitter survey and I said, well, to people out there, would you take a statin knowing it's not going to add a day to your life? 92% of them said no, they wouldn't. Where does diet fit into all of this when you look at chronic disease? Well, actually now it's estimated, and this is not a perfect science by any means, but you know, this is pretty extraordinary stuff. Poor diet now contributes to more disease and death globally than physical inactivity, smoking and alcohol combined. So where should we focus on the diet? Well, before we talk about that, and Nathan mentioned this before, and it's really great to hear a politician, it's rare to hear a politician saying we need a top down, this is not gonna happen from even a million people who end up watching this, even if we were to sell a million books or 20 million books giving this evidence. Ultimately, the food environment's working against you, it's gonna be very difficult to exercise healthy choices. So this is Tom Frieden's uh, health impact pyramid and it basically says that changing the context and making the healthy choice the, the default choice will have more impact than counselling or education so it needs regulation and there are lots of examples of this not least tobacco so when you look at cardiovascular disease deaths over the last three decades they've dropped dramatically the biggest impact responsible for at least 50% of that decline has come from smoking cessation and that happened not from education. Education is important, don't, don't, I don't deny that. But it came from targeting what we call the three A's in public health. The availability, the affordability, and the acceptability. One amazing example of this is in 2002 in Helena, Montana, the United States, when they brought in a public smoking ban, within six months, there was an absolute reduction, not really, absolute reduction, a 40% reduction in hospital admissions for heart attacks. Within six months of a smoking ban. And when the tobacco lobby weighed in and the law was rescinded, the admissions went back to the same levels as before. How can you explain that? Very briefly, passive smoking basically increases platelet activity, makes your blood more clottable. So when you remove the passive smoke out of the environment, people are less likely to have what we call plaque rupture and, and clots in their arteries that result in heart attacks. And taxation on cigarettes actually was responsible for the biggest decline in smoking, more than anything else. 
So the effect of a hierarchy means if you have policy-based interventions, it will be more effective because it will reach more parts of the population and is not dependent on sustained individual response. So sugar has got a lot of attention recently. I've been somebody that has, you know, as, as part of a, a group of people, I've been campaigning on this issue for a long time. But why should we pick on sugar? Well, you know, it was 1972 that um, British uh, physician and nutritionist John Yokin wrote a book called Pure White and Deadly. And he said, in the 50s and 60s, he looked at data and did research, and he said sugar was a major issue and we should target sugar. The reason that this came about is because heart disease deaths were increasingly increasing from 1920, peaking in around 1960. And there was a concern about where this, what was happening, why was this, um, you know, why, what was the cause of this increase. So John Yudkin said it was sugar, and sadly, um, he was hung out to dry because another researcher, Ansel Keys, in America felt that saturated fat was a major problem. And uh, his message was, uh, was, was taken, and uh, the sugar industry basically did whatever they could to discredit John Yudkin, even using various, various methods he talks about in his, to impede his work, interfered with his research and publication. Uh, Ansel Keys, it's reported, actually, you know, um, essentially called out Yudkin's work as being fraudulent. I mean, it was really quite extraordinary what happened to Yudkin. He was on his own. He was hung out to dry, and he died in 1995, and his warnings were no, no longer taken seriously until um, this man comes along, Professor Robert Lustig, Professor of Pediatric Endocrinology in the University of California, San Francisco, and he publishes an editorial in uh, Nature basically saying that sugar is the problem, sugar is toxic, sugar has become unavoidable. Uh, from his data, it's responsible for metabolic disease, type 2 diabetes is clearly linked to obesity. And he did a YouTube lecture as well, which has now got 6 million views, which is quite extraordinary. So I remember reading this myself. How did I get involved in all of this? I read the, uh, a news story on the BBC website about Robert Lustig, and I thought, it's interesting. I'd already started my kind of obesity campaign. When I'd done this, uh, looked at this, uh, when this patient came in and, and we talked about junk food in hospitals earlier, I wrote a letter, actually, an email, by chance, just uh, to Jamie Oliver. I got um, his PA's email address from a journalist friend of mine. And to my pleasant surprise, about six weeks later, Jamie emailed me back. I thought what he'd done about highlighting the importance of how bad school food was, um, I thought he could do something about hospitals as well. And to my pleasant surprise, he, he replied back and said, Jamie, would be thrilled to meet you. And I went, met Jamie several months later and discussed all of, um, all of the issues with several eminent doctors about what we need to tackle obesity. But in all of that, while that was going on, and obviously we knew that we needed to have public health campaign to target marketing of junk food, etc. I started looking and researching sugar after seeing Lustig's work. And essentially, I learned a few things myself. As a doctor, as a cardiologist, it may surprise you, but in medicine, we don't get taught anything. I don't remember or very little about nutrition in medical school, hardly anything. So first of all, I found out, well, actually, added sugar, you don't require any carbohydrate for energy from sugar at all. It's not required. And studies had started to show that sugary drinks were linked to weight gain and obesity. And the other thing that had been sort of neglected and hadn't got enough publicity was the fact that the most common cause of chronic pain and hospital admissions in young children in the UK is tooth decay. And the single biggest factor, maybe the only factor causing that, the only thing that you ingest that directly erodes teeth enamel is sugar. So, um, you know, the common wisdom is that, you know, had been that a calorie is a calorie and sugar is just empty calories. And... Uh, but, but what we know, actually, is that when you look at the data, um, sugar, excess consumption of sugar, promotes something called insulin resistance, which is the number one risk factor for heart attack. And 66% of people admit to hospital now fulfill criteria of something called metabolic syndrome, which is essentially insulin resistance, which is linked to sugar consumption and excess refined carbohydrates. And that basically is any three of the, of the five there of high blood pressure, um, high triglycerides in the blood, low HDL, which is good cholesterol, and increased waist circumference. And to put this in perspective, and this is a slightly crude slide, and this is why I also say there's no such thing as a healthy weight, up to 40% of people with a normal body mass index will actually have metabolic abnormalities linked to metabolic syndrome. And it's, so it's not about obesity. Obesity is actually, it's a major problem, but it's a marker of a much bigger problem. So we should be focusing on metabolic syndrome, which is where all the health um, issues and concerns and the costs come. And that includes prediabetes and type 2 diabetes also. So what does Coca-Cola say? Well, they say they want to get involved in helping us solve the obesity crisis. 
They say beating obesity will take action by all of us based upon one common simple common sense, sorry, one common sense fact. All calories count, no matter where they come from, including Coca-Cola and everything else with calories. That's the fiction. The science tells us that all calories are not the same. I don't think anybody here in their right mind would think that getting a calorie from foods uh, fibrous versus protein versus fat versus fructose has the same metabolic effect on the body. Of course it doesn't. Different nutritional value, different metabolic effects on the body. And this is probably one of the most key studies that I've cited several times in stuff I've published. And basically, um, this, looked at, this was carried out by Stanford researchers looking at what in the food environment predicts type 2 diabetes in the population. And they looked at 175 countries worldwide, and what they found for every excess 150 calories that was available for consumption that came from sugar versus fat or protein, there was an 11-fold increase in the prevalence of type 2 diabetes. But crucially, this was independent of body mass index and independent of physical activity. So in other words, a way to interpret that is, even if you're a normal body mass index and you exercise, but you consume too much sugar, you're increasing your risk of getting type 2 diabetes, which is pretty extraordinary. And later on, we wrote, I wrote a piece called You Can't Outrun a Bad Diet, which was also based upon this research here. So then I started looking at, so I looked at the research on sugar, and I was writing, a, I was doing an investigation, a bit of research myself for the BMJ. And this is, all of these things were mentioned in that editorial. And one thing that really shocked me is that I looked at um, what the American Heart Association was saying, because there was no recommendation, how much sugar should we be consuming? The American Heart Association, uh, Heart Association recommended in 2009 that the average adult male should consume no more than nine teaspoons of sugar, female six. U.S. Department of Agriculture said for the average four to eight year old child, four to eight year old child, no more than three teaspoons of added sugar per day. Now I've put this slide up because this is really, I still think is extraordinary. So this is labeling across Europe, in the UK and across Europe about how much sugar you should consume. It's a bit blurry, but essentially it says that, um, so this is, shows a, a typical can of Coca-Cola, which has, um, uh, it has about 30, 30 uh, about nine teaspoons of sugar in it. And according to this labeling, it basically says this represents 39% of your guideline daily amount of sugar consumption. So in effect, it's saying, for a consumer that looks at the label, you should be consuming 22 and a half teaspoons of sugar a day as part of your guideline daily amount. That's really extraordinary. So I thought, hold on, there's a bit of a disconnect here. The American Heart Association, uh, Heart Association is saying six teaspoons or nine for a male. And the labeling saying, and the limit they're saying this, the labeling's telling us to consume 22 and a half teaspoons of sugar a day. Incidentally, we know that the average consumer across Europe is consuming close to that anyway. So they are following the advice on sugar, on added sugar. <laughs> so this is what they said, the American Heart Association. Professor Lustig was also part of that document. So I, I, he's, an ind he's an independent scientist. He has no industry links whatsoever. He's a, I, I respect him for his scientific integrity, very much so. And uh, this is what they said. So um, what did the food industry do? The other thing I looked into this, I found basically in my investigation that the food industry had influenced the guidelines on sugar. But what they've done for years is they've said that it's about personal responsibility. That's the cause of the unhealthy diet. We're actually irresponsible. The, the nation is getting fatter because we're all greedy sloths, essentially. They raise fears that any intervention like taxation, for example, banning junk food advertising, is, uh, hinders his uh, uh, usurps personal freedoms. But we have to remember the greatest public health successes that have happened, whether it's safe drinking water, seatbelts in cars, smoke-free buildings, have all happened because of regulation. And there's another myth out there. We have this aging population, yes. We've added about 30 years to our lifespan since 1900. 30 years. 25 of those years have not come because of personal responsibility. They've come because of regulation, because of these interventions here. Of course, it, medical treatments have had an impact as well, but that's mainly for antibi from antibiotics for infections and acute treatments as well. Um, what else they do? Well, I've, I, and many of my colleagues and friends have been victims of this, and it's still ongoing, is that anyone that really suggests there should be regulation gets attacked. So they call us leaders of the nanny state, food fascists. They say that what we talk about, the sugar being a problem, that we are peddling junk science. So this is a, a very common part of the corporate playbook. And Kelly Brownell, 
a professor of public policy in the United States, has written a very amazing, really, an inspirational paper on this, which is called Big Tobacco Played Dirty and Millions Died, How Similar is Big Food? And just to put this in perspective, well, so the other thing as well to mention is that they emphasize physical activity over diet. Now, I'm very passionate about exercise, almost obsessively from a personal perspective. I've got a bias. You know, I have uh, played a lot of sports. I've captained sports teams at school and university. I go for walks every day. I go to the gym every so often. So I'm very active because I enjoy it. I know it's good for my health. But one thing that's very clear when you look at the data, when it comes to obesity, there's almost no link whatsoever between exercise and weight gain. It's all diet. That doesn't mean you shouldn't exercise. You shouldn't be sedentary. Of course, you shouldn't be sedentary. But actually, that benefit is for everybody. It doesn't matter your age and size. But when it comes to the obesity epidemic specifically, all of it is diet, diet, diet. But this is what they do. For a long time, a lot of people believed it's because of lack of exercise. And let's learn from history. It took 50 years from the first links published in the British Medical Journal suggesting there was a link between smoking and lung cancer before we actually had any effective regulation because the corporate playbook of Big Tobacco, they successfully adopted the strategy of planting doubt, denial, confusing the public, and even buying the loyalty of scientists. And the extent of that denialism, even as late on as 1994, the CEOs of every major tobacco firm went in front of US Congress and they swore under oath they did not believe nicotine was addictive or smoking caused lung cancer. That's the, that's the extent of that denialism. So I wrote this piece in the BMJ, 2013 May, to really try and raise awareness of sugar. It wasn't really getting any attention in the UK. I'd read Lustig stuff. I wrote about this and saying the dietary advice needs to change. We are recommending too much sugar to people. There's a big problem of sugar consumption across the board. Most processed foods have added sugar. It got press released and I ended up going on BBC Breakfast um, and spoke to uh, Susanna Reid and Bill Turnbull, primetime slot. It got picked up in some newspapers, the LA Times as well. And I discussed this and interestingly, Bill at the end of it turned to the uh, camera and he said, we should emphasize that we did ask 10 different companies or organizations associated with carbonated beverages, supermarkets, sugar manufacturers to discuss this with Dr. Malhotra. All of them were unavailable. I was very disappointed. <laughs> right, so moving on, lots of things happened. I got contacted by various scientists. I helped form an organization called Action on Sugar. We then decided there needs to be a, a real big public campaign and doctors need to get on board to say sugar was the major problem. And we uh, launched a, a campaign at the beginning of 2014. I was a science director and one of the founding members of Action Sugar. And it made headlines, um, you know, a pleasant surprise, the Daily Mail, who many people would consider um, a, a, a newspaper that is right of center, saying sugar is a new tobacco and really supporting our calls for regulation, which, is, which was really quite extraordinary. It became a very big story. Um, it became a world news story, in fact. And... Uh, you know, we made great progress initially for the first few days, yet then the empire struck back. So Andrew Lansley is the former Secretary of State for Health. And he got up in Parliament because we had some support, actually, we had political support. Keith Vaz, who's chair of the All-Party Diabetes Group, actually came out and made an early day motion calling on MPs to sign up to say, we support Dr. Malhotra and his colleagues in Action on Sugar, that there should be a campaign to reduce sugar consumption in the population. Mr. Lansley got up two days later in Parliament and he said this. He said, he dismissed this early day motion and he talked about the sugar new tobacco. He said, the analogy between sugar and tobacco was not appropriate. Sugar is essential to food. I thought this is interesting. So I saw this and then I wrote a piece in The Observer a few days later, which got a lot of attention. It was called, well, basically, this is an excerpt from this, public as en uh, Sugar is Public Enemy Number One in the Western Diet. So I wrote about uh, Mr. Lansley. He attempted to rubbish respected public health professor Simon Capel's statement that sugar is a new tobacco. It was in the press release. Lansley then compounded his errors by ignorantly asserting in the House that sugar is essential to food. It is not. He would have been more accurate in saying sugar is essential to food industry profits and lining the pockets of its co-opted partners. Lansley, Lansley was a paid director of marketing company Profero to the end of 2009. Profero's clients have included Pepsi, Mars, Pizza Hut and Diageo's Guinness. We didn't hear from Mr. Lansley again. <laughs> then, again, to our surprise, dispatches in the Sunday Times did an investigation. Maybe I shouldn't have been surprised. I didn't know about this. When I wrote the piece in the BMJ, I called on the Scientific Advisory Committee on Nutrition to change the guidance. 
And then an investigation by dispatches found that several members of the actual committee that decide on dietary advice in the UK had direct financial ties to confectionery giants. Ultimately, what happened, uh, which was a really great, great result, the World Health Organization very shortly later um, came out with the revised guidance and said that the maximum consumption of sugar, ideally for the average adult, should be no more than six teaspoons a day, which is great. And we, had, uh, we got a meeting with uh, Jeremy Hunt, who asked for us for a child obesity plan. And really, we summarized a few things there. Essentially, what I've talked about before, about curbing the availability of sugar. And we did say that we should have a sugary drinks tax as well. And we gave this plan to him. Um, as you know, we recently, just um, last Friday, the, uh, a tax on sugary drinks, a levy on sugary drinks was introduced in the UK, which I think is a tipping point. And really, uh, I think will be a historical moment. There's no room for complacency to reducing the obesity epidemic. But the other interesting, the Guardian also reported recently. So, you know, the major issue still is processed food and added sugar is in most processed foods. But ultra processed foods now constitutes half of the British diet, which even I was really quite shocked by. Half of the British diet is ultra processed food. And actually, that's the most important issue. I know there are debates about saturated fat, which looking at the evidence myself, it's very clear it's not linked to heart disease. But what, when, when we think about ultra-processed food, which is actually where a lot of the excess consumption of, of poor quality food and nutritionally poor food is coming from, what's really interesting is a separate study showed that ultra-processed food was linked to cancer. That was published in the BMJ. And I think this is an interesting slide because a lot of people talk about getting fat consumption down. Fat consumption has pretty much stayed the same. It's gone down slightly, probably, as a percentage, but it's, not, it's stayed the same in terms of its amount. But actually, most of the processed food, if you look at this slide, is coming from starch and sugar. It's not coming from fat. Even processed meats is little on there, is, is a small chunk. So most of the processed food is coming from starch and sugar. And that's where people are really, this is what's driving the type 2 diabetes epidemic. Um, investment Bank. Credit Suisse have even gone as far as to say we should, the best way to tackle the type 2 diabetes epidemic is going to be from taxing sugary food and drinks. And even they, their analysis suggests that's going to be the best way forward. So what do we do? Where do we go from here? Um, in 2015, I was a lead author on a paper that was signed off by some of the UK's most respected and authoritative doctors part of the Academy of Medical Royal Colleges, and we've called for a campaign to really, really reduce the harms of too much medicine in conjunction with the British Medical Journal, because we realize, we know, that there is a massive problem of overtreatment and, and too much medicines. And prescribed medications now are estimated by one respected scientist to be the third most common cause of death after heart disease and cancer. In the N NHS, uh, Sir Bruce Keir, the former medical director of the NHS, said, about one in seven operations and treatments are unnecessary and should never have been carried out in patients. So this campaign was launched and uh, it got a lot of publicity. It was press released. Um, the co-authors include uh, Professor Dame Sue Bailey, who was the chair, now former chair, and even the Terence Steve, Professor Sir Terence Stevenson, who's chair of the General Medical Council. So we have realized that this is a, a big problem and also that we have an ethical responsibility because if there's a lot of waste going on in the system on treatments and medications that really are not benefiting patients at all and causing harm, then there's a maldistribution of resources and that's an ethical consideration we have to look, at, look into. So we did give some next steps. I think the most important thing, I think for everybody to take away uh, from this, if you are a patient going to see your doctor, I think the most important, we, we, we actually put a series of questions that you should put to your doctor. So the first thing is, do I really need this test or procedure? What are the risks? Are there simpler, safer options? And what happens if I do nothing? It's interesting, only uh, two days ago in The Guardian, they reported on a study suggesting that, that we've got a big problem with over-medication affecting the environment now as well, that it's harming the ecosystem, it's even causing sex changes in fish and amphibians because of the amount of drugs from various antibiotics, anti-inflammatories, um, getting, into the, uh, getting into the water supply, which is really, really quite disturbing. And, they, and the researchers here have said, actually, we need to reduce the amount of medications that people are taking. I actually think now we need a national, we need a global campaign actually. We need a global campaign to reduce the amount of medications people are taking. Um, in the UK, more than half of patients over the age of 70 now, of the members of the public, are taking at least three medications. I was speaking to Richard on the train on the way here and I, I just think that's really extraordinary. It's really extraordinary that there's so many people are taking so many medications. 
So a little bit about the OPI diet. It's a book I wrote, published last year. And this is based upon a southern Italian village, which is considered one of the healthiest villages in the world. Um, it's interestingly the home of Ansel Keys, the scientist that told us saturated fat was a cause of heart disease. And he spent a lot of time in this village. And it's an amazing place. If you ever get a chance to go there, you must visit it. It's not very affluent. And we went there to try and find what their secrets were, just observing the people that live in this community, which hasn't changed much over the years. And their average life expectancy is close to 90. Many people live over the age of 100, but they age well, and they're certainly not taking lots of pills, I can tell you that. Uh, we ate at the local restaurant. The man who was running the local restaurant was 85 years old. The next day, we saw him fixing his own roof. You know, these people age well. So what we did is we wrote a book, myself and my co-author, Donald O'Neill, we wrote a book called The Piopi Diet based upon marrying the secrets of this village and actually the best available evidence and research that we have on what constitutes a healthy lifestyle and how impactful that is for your health. And there are a number of myths that we bust in there. Uh, one of them includes the fact if you're over 60, high LDL cholesterol, the so-called bad cholesterol, is not associated with heart disease and may protect you from an early death. But I think most importantly, the message is this, and this is what I've learned in my career, is lifestyle changes are more powerful than any drug at both preventing and treating heart disease, and they come without side effects. So really, this is what should be the forefront of medical care now to deal with the increasing burden of chronic disease. And an editorial I wrote with two very eminent cardiologists, don't just take my word for it, Professor Rita Redberg is editor of JAMA Internal Medicine, practicing, practicing cardiologist as well, like myself, and Pascal Meyer, also a practicing cardiologist, editor of Open Heart. We wrote an editorial in the British Journal of Sports Medicine, which became the most read, uh, pleasantly surprised by this, of all BMJ Journal articles last year. And it was basically saying saturated fat does not clog the arteries, and coronary artery disease is a chronic inflammatory condition, the risk of which can be rapidly reduced by lifestyle changes, simple lifestyle changes. And that involves what we call a high-fat Mediterranean diet, but basically a diet that is based on lots of vegetables, non-starchy vegetables ideally, olive oil, oily fish, nuts, and is low in refined carbohydrates and sugar. And if you do that, and you walk every day for at least 30 minutes, and you think about stress and getting a better sleep, actually this can overcome a lot of the burden of chronic disease. And interestingly, at the heart of this, as I said before, is insulin resistance. Insulin resistance is a precursor to type 2 diabetes. It's a normal risk factor for heart attacks. And about 50% of patients who have high blood pressure is rooted in insulin resistance. Now, how effective is this? What evidence do we have that this actually works? So this is a little anecdote of a, on Facebook. I've never met this person. I have lots of emails from people, and people send me stuff every, every day of their stories, which I just think is amazing. Uh, and this gentleman, he, with his permission, I told him I was going to uh, name him and give his, put his picture up today here, um, in Malaysia. This is a chap with type 2 diabetes who had it for several years. And essentially, from ignoring, he said here that he decided he didn't want to take a statin and metformin, because of, probably because of side effects, I don't know. He ignored his uh, doctor's advice and decided to follow the advice of things he'd read by people like myself and other people, as Jason Fung in America. And it's really extraordinary. He's essentially reversed his type 2 diabetes or certainly come off medications. He's reduced his blood pressure. I've seen patients who've come to see me, one in particular I remember, who had been on blood, four blood pressure pills and within months of changing his diet, that's all he did. He's come off three of his blood pressure pills that he was taking. And he's come off his diabetes medications. So this stuff works. Now, some people would argue, hold on, this is anecdote. It's working for these people, but is there any other evidence for this? Well, there is some great work going on by diabetes.co.uk, an independent organization in the UK. And they have done a lot of uh, work where they've got a, a program, which essentially is very similar to what we say in the Piopi diet, is low refined carbs in the diet, no, count, no counting calories. And they have managed to show in a significant proportion of patients who've managed to, off, to come off their medications, certainly reduce their medications, most of them, many patients putting their type 2 diabetes into remission, which is really quite extraordinary. I mean, it's amazing data. Uh, and this is on thousands and thousands of people. In the United States, a very similar program being adopted by Verta Health. Um, and in their program, uh, in, in a year, 60% of their patients reverse uh, diabetes and glycemic control improves and they reduce the need for medications. Again, ignoring the government guidelines that say put starchy carbohydrates at the base of the diet and fear fat. These, this advice says don't fear fat and don't put starchy carbohydrates at the base of your diet. So we're getting towards the end now. <laughs> I know other people need to speak and we're getting on. But uh, I'm just a little, a little quiz for you here. 
So as a cardiologist, I care more about heart disease than anything else. It's still one of the biggest killers of, uh, and causes of premature death around the world. So a little bit of a quiz for you. NNTs, no one needs to treat for heart disease, for death, okay? So if you take aspirin every day for five years and you've had a heart attack, so these people have had a heart attack, there's a one in a hundred chance that taking a statin will save your life. Statins, if we trust the data implicitly, okay, you've got to take it with a pinch of salt, industry-sponsored data, there's a 1 in 83 chance if you take a statin every day for five years and you've had a heart attack, it will save your life. Aspirin and statins at low risk if you haven't had a heart disease or have a heart attack, you don't suffer from heart disease. Infinity, you're not going to live one day longer from taking a statin. If you have stents during a heart attack, okay, so I said they're a life-saving procedure, with everything else we do, the stent itself, having a heart attack, an acute heart attack, there's about a 1 in 40 chance the stent procedure itself will save your life. Stents at any other time, well, you already know the answer. They will not prolong your life. They do not even prevent heart attacks. So what's the most effective coronary intervention tool we have based upon published data that we have that's available? Any guesses for people with heart disease? What's the most powerful thing we can do? Mediterranean diet. Now, this is one study, and I admit there are limitations, but still that's very powerful information. That dietary changes, people with heart disease, had such a big impact on mortality reducing heart disease. But we've sequestered that information, we've held it back. That information is out there, it's very powerful. And in this crisis that we have in healthcare, you know, when everybody in the room knows that a heart stent is not going to prevent a heart attack, but following the Mediterranean diet is the most effective tool we have, then that's when you have real transparency. That's when you have accountability. That's when you have real quality in healthcare. That's when you're practicing evidence-based medicine to help patients. And that's what we need more than anything else. And I would actually argue that holding back this information, doesn't, it's not just the fact that we are using biased information to make clinical decisions, the least support patient outcomes and is unethical. I would argue this is an attack on democracy. This is an attack on the principles of democracy. People making everyday decisions on misinformation, on half-truths, that they would, would change their decision-making process if they were given the full information. And at the end, uh, last year I wrote a piece in The Guardian, I basically said it was covered in the, in the eye today as well. I said that essentially I think the situation is so dire with the fact we're not tackling research misconduct, the fact that there is too much commercial influence on medical guideline bodies, the fact that patients are not being given information in a transparent way, that it really needs a deep... I think it's so deep-rooted, it's a system failure. It's not about pointing fingers at individuals. It's a system failure. It needs an inquiry on the scale of what we had with Chilcot into the Iraq war in the UK. And this is a quote from the second President of the United States, which I, I love, which is, "...the preservation of the means of knowledge is amongst the lowest ranks, is of more importance to the public than all the property of all the rich men in the country." And my final slide, perhaps regretfully, the pioneering heart transplant surgeon Christian Barnard said towards the end of his life, I have saved the lives of 150 people with heart transplantations. If I had focused on preventive medicine earlier, I would have saved 150 million. It turns out lifestyle is that medicine. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I think we've had a lot of food for thought there, and um, I think for me one of the most important things that you said was lifestyle change is more powerful than any drug, and it has no side effects. And I, I know from personal experience that that is the case. We would now like to, we're very honoured to hear from Sir Richard Thompson, who was the personal physician to Her Majesty the Queen, and also a former president of the Royal College of Physicians. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gillen. The, the, the honour is mine, I think, and I'm sorry about that terrible photograph. Um, <laughs> I'd like to support, obviously, everything that uh, Asim Mahotrin <coughs> said, and uh, I'll run over some of the things he said to support that. First of all, Peter Wilms, as you mentioned, is a hero of mine. He literally put his house on, on the margin to try and fight an American company who took him to court, uh, and he's really emphasised in my country the problems that occur, particularly among doctors and uh, companies. Well, first of all, uh, have you got the thing for the slides? Yep. Yeah. First of all, public health. Um, as you know, public health has improved overall our health much more than any, any doctors have done in terms of 
improving water supply and diet and things like that. But I'm particularly upset when I see that so many people spend a lot of money, billions in fact in England, on supplements, on gluten-free diet, which are completely unnecessary unless you have celiac disease, on vegan diets we were talking about uh, on the train, and uh, every tube station you go in in uh, London, you see great investments for vitamins that are required for teen, teens and babies and pregnant women and old people. Complete nonsense. Very few people need vitamins. I've worked myself for many years on zinc, for instance, and zinc is very rare, very rarely required as a supplement, uh, certainly in, uh, in uh, Europe, although in developing countries it may well be needed. Asim has mentioned alcohol and cigarettes, and I put up there that the government is very reluctant, and it is very reluctant to change. I myself asked, uh, when I was at the College of Physicians, asked Andrew Lansley, the previous Secretary of State, to stop uh, make illegal smoking in cars, because my college had shown that secondary smoking, as Asim mentioned, is in fact a deterioration to health, much to my surprise. Uh, and he's said, no, it's a step too far, and it took the MPs in the English Parliament to force him to do that. So they're very resistant. And of course, companies are very resistant. As you know, one of the big tobacco companies took the Australian government to court in Hong Kong uh, to try and prevent their move to have plain packaging on cigarettes. So as I seem to say, the companies resist any improvement uh, that one uh, wants to achieve. And alcohol, which I'm very interested in as a gastroenterologist, we have argued for years to have a, mi a minimum price for alcohol to prevent the heavy alcoholics drinking cheap alcohol, which is often cheaper than water in supermarkets uh, in the UK. But that was resisted by uh, the companies who fought the, uh, for years the Scottish government who were trying to, induce, uh, to introduce a minimum uh, unit price. So I'm afraid the companies are very liable for trying to prevent many of these changes uh, occurring. And then fat and carbohydrate, I've been educated by Asim because I used to tell my patients to stop eating too much fat if they're overweight, uh, which of course is very effective, but actually it's not any effective, but also better, as he's explained to me, in the words of two, symbol, two syllables, uh, to reduce your carbohydrate rather than your fat. And then uh, wrong treatment. Uh, we all know now the problems with antibiotics. It's multiple problems. It's certainly prescribed too much. Uh, I understand in parts of Europe you can get them over the counter uh, and we have to change that because as you know there's a big risk of getting really completely resistant organisms such as in tuberculosis and things which will cause a major problem uh, and certainly some transplant units have had to close down because of that. As he was mentioned some procedures which are completely uh, useless and trials have shown that knee washouts are, are, are useless, tonsillectomy is often uh, useless, cardiac uh, uh, bypasses and stents, as he said, and meshes, which Carl Hennigan, who can't be here today, uh, has managed to uh, achieve a ban on those in this country. Reminds me of the joke about nails in coffins, and that is, why do they put nails in coffins? That's to prevent medical oncologists giving any more treatment. <laughs> and when you think of it, that any good joke has truth in it. They do go on and on and on. If you look at the trials in the New England Journal of Medicine, there's a tiny improvement in longevity of a few weeks uh, after many months of treatment with a lot of side effects. What are we doing giving these drugs? Someone has pointed out that we probably treat uh, 100 patients with breast cancer with drugs in order to improve 10. We need more selective treatment. And then too much medicine, which uh, say I see was part of that program through the Academy uh, of Medical Royal Colleges in London, Statins, uh, he's very big on that. I've been interested in alteplase for stroke, you know, the thrombolytic agent which is given. The evidence through the trials is very poor. It's the same problem with, with statins. And yet when you approach the regulators, as a colleague of mine, uh, Roger Shinton, and in England and myself have done, the medical uh, uh, health, uh, the, the uh, Committee of health, health Medicine and so on, the MHRA as well, when you approach them, they really don't want to do it. They, they'll set up a sort of working party, but that does rubbish everything that we say. It's been very disappointing. And then there are things like gastrostomies, feeding gastrostomies, tubes going to the stomach to feed people who are not swallowing. Sometimes very appropriate, but I know in my own family it happens to people with a devastating stroke, unable to swallow and are fed through a tube entirely. You wonder what are we doing as doctors or indeed as the public who have to change this? Uh, to these people who should be basically allowed to die gently. 
blood transfusions. I had friends who have been given the last week or two of life with cancer. Why are we doing this, trying to keep them alive for a few more days? Partly it's financial. Uh, some of these procedures and things are done, done for financial reasons, both by the doctors and particularly in the states, by the institutions to get more money for their hospitals. But partly I think is because people are not prepared uh, to say too much uh, is going on, we must stop it. And then Bad Pharma, some of you would have read Dr. Ben Goldacre's excellent book on Bad Pharma, which is stuffed with examples of how the big pharmaceutical companies have behaved very badly. Many treatments that are hiked that turn out not to be effective. The, the, I, I, like Kasim, I talked about the Oxford Union rather than the Cambridge Union, entitled Profits Before Patients. And they do. They, they, in the States particularly, they are basically, I think, very often dishonest. They push the benefits and completely deny the negative side effects, as we've, uh, as we've already heard. And uh, they lobby the government, of course, to make sure that regulation, particularly in the States, is limited. In, in the UK, they're trying to control that and control the prices, but because in the States it's driven by the insurance industry, it's very difficult to do so. And then playing with patents, of course, that is, if a company has a drug they, and it's running out of the patent period, they then suggest it might be good in children or for some other uh, uh, disease, and they therefore get an extension of their patent. And when uh, the so-called confirmatory trials are done, they're often very limited, as reading on the train are very limited and not repeated in many cases. And of course many trials, even, un even though they're published uh, trials as protocols, uh, t turn out not to be, the results not to be published at all. And I think all negative trials should be published, as I'll say in a moment. But we mustn't forget, just to use a negative thing, that although the things we talk about are humanitarian and benevolent, and here am I, perhaps over the average age for 100 years ago, so it's wonderful I'm living longer, but it's very costly because you have to pay pensions uh, all that time and you have to provide end of life care. And the public health doctor thought that by uh, improving care up to the end of life, you'd actually cut the cost. You'd have compressed morbidity and morbidity. You would you'd only be ill for a shorter time. Sadly, that's not true. And as you know, 90% or more of the cost, average cost, uh, of medicine in your life is compressed into the last year. You come in, I think I just read in the British Medical Journal, five times uh, on average each year and your, the cost of those emergency emissions as a very elderly patient at the end of life is in the, in the terms of several billion. So what, we, what you really want to know is what we're going to do about it. I have a few thoughts. As I seem said, more rigorous analysis, the number need to treat an absolute difference is very important. I think doctors particularly, I'm not expecting patients to read the, patient, the papers uh, in journals, but in fact the doctors should be much more critical uh, looking at the papers and learn to read them, uh, initially I think at medical school, uh, but also in doctors as well. He, as he mentioned shared decisions, and that's absolutely right, I think patients should discuss more with doctors. Very often they say, what do you want to do, what do you suggest I should do, doctor? But nevertheless, if you mention side effects, some side effect to one person is quite different from the side effect to another. They think some things are more or less important. And the studies have shown, as he said, the amount of procedures carried out are reduced uh, if you have sh <coughs> shared decisions. So educate students and doctors, as I said, tremendous scepticism of treatment. We should start by saying, do we really think this treatment works rather than let's try it, let's give it? And most people are endlessly defending the, uh, the, the treatment that they give. They do everything to prove that that treatment is effective rather than saying the so-called null hypothesis, I don't think it works. What evidence is there that it does work? I'll be really critical of these things. I'm against the idea of fast-track drugs, which has come in with the FDA in the US, but also, I think, proposed in the UK. I think this is very dangerous because you never know when side effects are going to occur until it's been used. I was involved with a drug called Practical a few years ago, which we won't have heard of, a very good drug for cardiac uh, dysrhythmias. Uh, and it was only years later we discovered a minority of patients who got a terrible disease of the bowel, which is fascinating, but no one's shown why it occurred. And that's an extreme example. But uh, if you shove uh, treatment through, it's then uh, not rigorously analysed, but well shown to be not effective and well shown to have more side effects. We should limit the lobbying of legislators. There's no doubt that the government ministers are lobbied 
by alcohol, by tobacco, indeed. Lord Howe was one of the ministers said it was his job to see them, which I sort of accept, but I think they are much more uh, influenced by, by uh, uh, pharm pharmaceutical companies and alcohol and tobacco companies than by doctors. I think we should introduce the Sunshine Act in uh, the UK. This is the act in the States where all the doctors have to declare all the money they receive from the pharmaceutical industry and the industry has to report it so it's all open. We persuaded the Association of British Pharmaceutical Industry some differently but they did agree to uh, make a voluntary register so they now record uh, everything is on the web, the amount of money they've given the doctors and the doctors themselves have a voluntary obligation to declare it. Naturally, the 20% who are not declaring it almost certainly are the ones who are getting a lot of money, and we know they do receive a lot. And however much you may think you're clean and white as a driven, driven snow, you are always influenced by this sort of money. I've had money myself from my unit many years ago. There's no doubt that, that you don't want to change your position. You try and support the ideas uh, and influence that you've had. How are we going to improve the analysis of the guide of the papers? I think particularly to the specialist societies and in my country, the colleges as well, they should be the ones who look much more rigorously at what is done and put out guidelines to the members of the society, Cardiac Society, etc. I think we should be very wary about conflicts of interest in the regulators. Uh, the committees uh, have been slightly involved with their ultra plays. There are clearly many people on the committees who are conflicted. The CEO of the MHRA, in fact, comes from fast food industry, and so does now the new deputy CMO. Uh, uh, the Chief Medical Officer in the UK. They may be absolutely unconflicted, I can't tell, but it's very suspicious when people have this background. Mm -hmm. Are they really going to go into the business with a clean mind? And I think, all, as he said, as all drug results should be published, positive as well as negative, and particularly negative. The journals are very unkeen, they in fact should put negative trials uh, more prominently, and the evidence is that negative trials are more likely to be right. Mm -hmm. We probably won't get on to it, but in fact the pharmaceutical companies I think should be influenced by shareholders because they're pension companies and they have huge returns on the stock market. We should encourage companies to use corporate social responsibility as well as just making money. And we should consider whether too many people are admitted from care homes to die when they should be dying in the care homes. And my own particular worry is we should think about assisted dying. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sir Richard. We will now hear from Professor Pale, who is an internist, endocrinologist, and professor of diabetology at Leiden University. Thank you. Thank you. It's, it's an honor to, uh, to be here. Um, let me tell you a story of uh, a patient. Um, Wim was, was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes in 2001 at the age of 40, and he was treated with metformin uh, according to protocol. And metformin stabilized but not normalized his blood sugar levels. Um, over the years, his blood sugar increased, and he was prescribed another additional drug uh, uh, according to protocol as well. And um, he also got a drug to uh, control his um, his cholesterol and his blood pressure. Unfortunately, even that was not enough um, up until the point in 2014 when he was prescribed insulin to, um, to, control, to further control his blood glucose levels, which had, had risen even more. So he started his, his insulin treatment in 2014. In 2015, he had gained 10 kilograms of weight his blood sugar was still not in control. And at that point, his son uh, came up to him and he said, listen, Dad, if you go on like this, you won't see me finish my studies. And um, Wim decided to totally change uh, his approach of the disease. Um, what he did was he um, cut out his, the sugar and starch from his diet to a minimum. He started eating unprocessed foods and he increased his physical activity. This was Wim, Bim uh, one year later. He lost 40 kilograms. 
He's without any drug. He stopped his insulin. He used 200 units of insulin before changing his lifestyle, uh, which is a, a tremendous amount. So one year later, he lost 40 kilograms. He's without any drug. He stopped all his drugs and his blood sugar level, his cholesterol and his blood pressure are perfectly normal. Now, this story is meant to illustrate the, the power of lifestyle intervention in lifestyle related disease as opposed to drugs. The drugs simply didn't work. They work a little bit but not enough. And with lifestyle you can completely reverse this disorder. Um, this is the number of people in the Netherlands per 1000 with one or more chronic diseases. Uh, we live in a sick society. About 40% of people uh, in, be in between 40 and 50 years of age have one or more chronic diseases in the Netherlands. Um, these are the associated costs predicted to double in 2040 to 174 billion euros. And we know for a long time, many of these diseases, these chronic disorders, are lifestyle related. And we know for a long time, this is data from science uh, in 2002, that the vast majority of these disorders are preventable by lifestyle change. We can prevent people from becoming diabetic. And we can prevent people from getting a heart attack by um, a changing uh, lifestyle. And we know now more and more that we can treat, a reverse or even sometimes cure these disorders once they are there by changing lifestyle. So what I call for a lifestyle, I'm sorry, <laughs> I call for a lifestyle medicine um, as the treatment of these lifestyle related diseases to take away the root cause of these diseases, and not drugs. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. That was um, very poignant, really, because I think the reality of what you, that story that you just told um, strikes home to not only myself, but I think a lot of the people who are here today as well about the fact that we can be masters of our own destiny and we can... Um, we don't have to just accept what has happened to ourselves with health issues. We can actually change that. And with that in mind, we're now going to hear from Sarah Macklin, who is um, a journalist and also a nutritionist. And um, I think she's going to tell us some very interesting things about nutrition and about what we can eat. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I feel very privileged to be here to talk regarding nutrition. Um, we all know it's a very modifiable and preventable lifestyle factor that we can have within ourselves to change our health status. Um, my background was originally in fashion, which I saw a very unhealthy nutritional approach, which drove me to study a Bachelor of Science in Human Nutrition. And whilst in university, I was very aware of the outdated guidelines that they're still teaching us regarding nutrition and what we're meant to be consulting to our patients when we see them. And that became very apparent to me when my dad actually got type 2 diabetes a couple of years ago. And I was very interested when he went to go and see a dietitian, what she was going to advise him and what I was then going to advise him. And I don't know how many of you have seen it, um, but this is the current role model for our health today. And it's called the Eat Well Plate, and I like to call it the Eat Bad Plate. <laughs> because basically the advice is very misleading. It doesn't relate to the current evidence that we know. Um, my dad was based on a very starchy, high carbohydrate diet, even though he had insulin resistance. And we know that obviously starchy carbohydrates increase our glucose metabolism and increase our insulin resistance. Many people with diabetes have an overwhelming intolerance to glucose and then they put a medication to reverse that. What we do know is that reducing the amount of 
refined carbohydrate and starch carbohydrates, which are based in the Eat Well plate, and just increasing our fat intake from natural sources can actually really help as a preventative measure. Stuff that Aziz's book's based on, and that Nathan as well has, has seen. Um, so what we can see from the Eat Well plate is it was actually resized some of the segments in 2016. But majority, 33% of our intake is meant to be based on such carbohydrates. There is probably only potatoes and porridge on that page that isn't processed. Everything else is a processed carbohydrate. And this is the advice that we're giving to people who want to improve their health. This is what they go to as their role model for food. And this is something that I find very hard that I'm meant to be teaching as a nutritionist, the guidance that we're given. Also on the other side, we have got lots of vegetables which are wonderful, but we also have high fructose foods instead of bananas and lots of fruit. And people would advise five a day, but we know that most people would opt for fruit over vegetables, high increase in fructose, and we know that raisins and dried fruit, which are also recommended in the, in the guidelines of this Eat Well plate, are incredibly high in fructose and sugar, and also actually more, have more sugar in and more fructose in than a can of Coke. So again, we've got lots of glucose and lots of fructose, and we know, from what Azim says, of how that can drive our insulin resistance and how that is actually having a massive impact on our health. So we're having 33% of our energy intake in the form of such carbohydrate, and a 33% energy percent intake a lot from fructose and glucose as well. We then have a section which is quite small, which is the blue section, if you can see, and this is on our calcium-rich foods. They are all advised, every single calcium-rich food, to be low-fat. But what do we know is low-fat? It's high in sugar. So again, we're advising more sugar to my patients, more low-fat foods. That doesn't increase our satiety. We know that high-fat foods make us want to eat less, therefore we lose weight. They're also much more delicious, in my opinion, than low-fat foods, and I would opt for that any day. And then we have a very small segment, which still to this day surprises me that didn't get changed in 2016, but it's on fats, and it's extra virgin olive oil. And that is recommended to have a very, very, very small part in our diet. But from the evidence that we know, how protective extra virgin olive oil can be and fat and saturated fat and how this isn't actually the leading crisis of our obesity epidemic. That actually this can help our obesity epidemic and help people with diabetes. But we don't want to be advising this to any of our patients. This segment, until 2016, had cans of coke in it. And we decided to replace the can of coke with healthy fats, which is olive oil. So I find that mind-boggling still, that we still, in the corner of our plate, also have crisps and chocolate. It's still on our guide, and this is what we're advising. This whole, this whole map here is an increase in insulin resistance, and this is what I believe is driving the obesity epidemic. And this is why we need to reinform the public and reinform everybody here to eat real food, unprocessed food, to read the labels. All of these cans that are on here as well are full of sugar, they're full of fructose. And these people don't understand that buying these foods are only going to increase the insulin resistance. And so this is why I believe that we're in the obesity epidemic that we're in right now, 60 million, 16 billion pounds a year, is being related to this role model of the eat bad play that I like to call it. And I'm only going to touch on this very shortly because Azim has already mentioned an overwhelming evidence that has shown how a high carbohydrate diet can increase your insulin resistance and how we shouldn't be afraid of fat in any way, shape or form. If we literally increase our fat, high fat foods from natural sources, this isn't fried foods, this is good sources of fat, good sources of dairy, cheese, things that we shouldn't be scared of, we would just naturally decrease our processed carbohydrates and it would become more of a balance within our system. The Pure study, which is 18 countries, found that a higher carbohydrate diet was increased to a total risk of mortality. Not just cardiovascular disease, but a total mortality risk. And they found that a high-fat diet was associated with a lower mortality risk. And this wasn't just for 
normal fats. This is every single fat. You're polyunsaturated, you're saturated fat that we're all scared of. <coughs> it was shown to have a reduced mortality. And the pre-med trial, which actually looked at a primary prevention for cardiovascular disease, found that a high-fat diet had a 30% more improvement over a low-fat. So surely we can see here that the evidence says that we shouldn't be afraid of fats and that we're eating too many processed carbohydrates, which is making our obesity epidemic, especially our type 2 epidemic of diabetes, even worse today. And the, the message that I want you all to take home is to not be scared of real food, to eat real food, to look at all your labels, to be really aware, because what marketing is very, very clever to do is misguide you down the wrong path. And that's what the Eat Well Plate is currently doing. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. That was, um, that was very, very interesting for me, especially because I remember being given a photocopy with that Eat Well or Eat Bad diet on. Um, and I'll, I'll touch on that in a few minutes. I just wanted to, to round up this section very quickly by saying how, um, how grateful I am to, to our panelists for coming quite a long way to speak to us today. Um, and I hope that the people who have been watching this from home and the rest of you as well will take this opportunity to, to pass on the link to this and ask your friends also to pass on the link to the live stream so that they can through viral, you know, through the internet virally, we can reach that one million mark because I believe that we can do that. Now, I was, um, I was told by my nurse that my doctor wanted me to go on to statins because my cholesterol was slightly high. And I said to the nurse, well, show me, you know, show me my statins and she showed me a readout. And I said, well, are you taking statins and she said oh no no, no I, I, you know i wouldn't take statins you know. i said well um well why should i i said let me go away for a month and i'll come back and i'll get my cholesterol down and i went away and i read and studied about what i needed to do through eating healthy food natural food you know unrefined food legumes, um, oats, things like that, that would bring down my cholesterol. And sure enough, I had the blood test, I went back, and oh yeah, you don't need to take statins, you're fine. And it just showed me that, why didn't the doctor tell me to do that? Or the nurse? Why didn't they say your, your cholesterol is high? Go away and eat healthy, and this is what you should be eating. And so my question, I have a question for, for Sarah, is that, um, Basically, I believe strongly it is possible through nutrition to get ourselves healthier or healthy. What is it that is stopping the government or our doctors, our health professionals from giving the healthy plate as opposed to that bad one? Yeah, I think it's a great question and it's still one that baffles me and I still can't 100% answer you because for common sense and what we know we should be able to make these, we should be able to inform the public straight away of all these healthy guidelines. But I think doctors, as Azim said, don't have any nutritional training during their medical school. A lot of doctors are misinformed about nutrition, which is why I think they need to work very closely with nutritionists and dietitians. But also, the regulatory boards, such as the AFN, um, we have ethical guidelines that we have to stick to. And I think it's quite hard when you're taught this in school and you have to conform to it. Otherwise, you're very controversial. But what I know is that that doesn't help my clients that come yeah. and see me. And that's very detrimental. And it didn't help my dad. And from him seeing a dietitian to him seeing me, we actually got his, him off his insulin resistance. Excellent. And got him healthier again. And I think there just needs to be more people speaking up about the current evidence, about the current advice, more of the public also speaking up, having a voice, you know, more of these case studies that are coming forward that we know that to not be scared of fat and to eat real food. But also I have tried to change the formation of vending machines that are full of 
sugar foods and they're in our hospitals, mm. they're in our workplaces. We're surrounded by this 24 7. And where I work, I've actually taken out the vending machine and restocked it full of healthy foods. And I think if we can slowly start helping our obesogenic environment that we are living in and surrounding ourselves also with, with more choice of healthy foods rather than the grab and go culture that we're in, that can also help. Excellent, thank you. Um, I would like to just open up for general discussion now to, to the people who are here. So if anybody has a question for anybody specifically or just to the panel as a whole, then please feel free just to uh, raise your hand and ask a question and we'll, we'll go straight to you. Tony. Um, firstly, just to say, very impressive, very convincing, and I find what you told me about Sir Rory Collins, frankly, scandalous. Um, my question is this. Um, you slightly remind me of uh, those who said that cholera was waterborne, trying to undo the thinking of those who said that cholera was airborne. In other words, you are trying to overturn 30 or 30 plus years, perhaps or probably more, of consensus. And that is always difficult. And my question to you is, when I listened to you, I was convinced by the arguments, but I then thought, in all your solutions, there seemed to be too much of the stick and not enough of the carrot. So my question to you is, how can you transform your solutions in order to encourage and make what I will describe as virtue easier by adding in more carrot rather than emphasising the stick. Very good. Do you want to go that? Um, so a few things to be said here. I think it needs a multifaceted approach. At the beginning, I think what was important is, first of all, the acknowledgement that science evolves, things change, information that you may have had 30 years ago uh, may have been incomplete, it may be flawed, and part of the problem why we're not reversing this is basically the science alone is not sufficient. Evident, um, opposition from vested interests needs to be overcome. So there are a lot of vested interests that profit from the old order. Whether it's low-fat foods or cholesterol-lowering drugs, we're talking about a multi-billion dollar industry here. And to overturn that overnight is not going to be easy. But we have a duty as doctors and as scientists to reflect the totality of the evidence. So I think... There's part of that as well, and there's, you know, lots of, um, there are academics that have made their careers based upon something that is seen to be flawed at best, and uh, they're in very powerful positions. And there are also many people with major conflicts of interest who are making decisions about policy and the way forward. So across the system, uh, that, uh, that needs to change, that needs to be highlighted, there needs to be sunlight on this, because unless there's sunlight and people aren't aware of it, you're not going to change it. Um, but there are lots of things that need to be done. I don't think it's just one thing. I, I think that you have to absolutely uh, nudge people and educate them. That has to be part of the solution. But then you've also got to make sure that their, uh, the environment helps them to make those healthy choices. One of the things, uh, well, uh, several years ago, 2012 actually, I did a report for BBC Newsnight. And after I'd written a piece in The Observer about junk food in hospitals, I did a report about the Olympic Games and I was the angry cardiologist that said we're in the mi middle of an obesity epidemic and I find it obscene that our main sponsors are Coca-Cola, McDonald's, etc. But one thing that was very interesting, when we were filming we went to near the Olympic Village and I was with the producer and uh, you know, it was a bit overcast and he wanted to wait a few hours be until it got a bit brighter before we did a filming outside. So I was in the Olympic Village, or near the Olympic Village, where we'd just spoken to a GP who said most of the people that he'd seen, new cases of type 2 diabetes were related to lifestyle. Um, and I, I got hungry. So I wanted to go and look for something healthy to eat. I had a, an idea in my mind. I knew what, what's healthy food. Um, and uh, I couldn't find anything. I was walking and walking and walking. In the end, I went into KFC and had corn on the cob. That was basically what I ate. The point I'm making is, there needs to be that element of um, government and regulatory intervention to, for, for people that have, don't have access, you can't access personal responsibility. I think, I think that's, does that answer your question? Yes, I, 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 I'm, also trying to give, uh, I'm also trying to give you a message. 
which is that applying nudge theory, which I think you have to do with things like this, you always want to try and think through how can we incentivize virtue rather than punish vice. Okay. Um, I'm just going to pass over to Sir Richard. Well, well I'm actually a great believer in the stick. As Sir Michael Marmot, who's a famous public health doctor in, in uh, uh, the UK, said the only improvements in public health have come through legislation, clean air acts, seat belts, going right back to the 19th century. People don't change. So I think we have to legislate, we have to try and control the pharmaceutical companies, we have to produce minimum unit price for uh, alcohol, we ban cigarettes. I think otherwise it just won't happen voluntarily. But you're quite right, there is the nudge unit in the Department of Health in uh, uh, London which is looking at all these things, how you nudge people. And it's very subtle, apparently. If you put a notice up in your hotel bedroom saying it would be very good uh, if, you don't, uh, if you reuse your, your towels, uh, and uh, it'll help the environment. That doesn't work as well as saying, I notice saying, many people uh, don't reuse their, their uh, towels. It's as subtle as that. Uh, and they do the studies of that. Or notice saying, don't walk on the grass, doesn't work as well as saying, uh, many people don't walk on the grass. So you're absolutely right, and the science behind nudge is very important. Thank you, very interesting. Did you want to yeah. say um, yes, and I, I would like to add, as far as um, food is concerned, we have to realize that, well, at, at least I believe that we won't, um, we won't um, induce big changes without regulations either, because um, we, we have to realize that the, the, um, our like, the, the, the fact that we like sugar is biologically driven. The fact that we like um, the wrong things actually in our food, it's biologically driven. Uh, it has evolutionary roots, very, very strong evolutionary roots. So if we leave this to the market, I'm convinced that we will reach the, perhaps 10% or for 20% of the people, but the, the masses we won't reach because it's simply um, biologic, the biological drive to eat all these sugary um, uh, sweet things. Yeah, no, I just actually wanted to add with you, unless we impact the sugar companies so high that we put on high tax, that will have to draw them to reduce the amounts of sugar in those foods. That's the only way that we're really going to stop this high sugar environment that we're currently experiencing, is by increasing the tax on the sugar products so highly that the manufacturers have to start decreasing the amount of sugar in their foods. It, it was a, a huge surprise to me when I started actually looking at food labels and what was in the food to realize that there was pretty much sugar or aspartame or some other kind of sweetener in practically every single food. And that isn't fair really on people who are trying to eat healthily and people who have busy lifestyles and who want to be able to eat healthy, but so-called healthy foods are just full of sugar or sweeteners. So um, I believe there's a question over there. Thank you. Yes, I know people that uh, eat well, that have a good lifestyle and still have high cholesterol. Mm -hmm. Is there in some cases, do you say that in that case, I would prescribe statins or not? <laughs> So I could talk about this for a very long time. Um, the first thing to say is high cholesterol itself for the overall majority of people is not a risk factor for heart disease, a significant one. It's very much down the bottom of the list. The statin prescription guidelines, interestingly, are not based upon cholesterol. They're based upon risk profile. So actually, if, you do, if you're otherwise healthy and you have a high cholesterol, there's a slightly high cholesterol, that's not an indication for statins. Um, what I would say, uh, and, and the evidence is evolving on this, one of the things I was involved in was original research looking at all the data to see what the association with cholesterol was with heart disease and early death, just at looking at people over the age of 60. There was no association whatsoever. In fact, there was a suggestion of it protected you from early death. And one of the reasons for that is cholesterol is a vital molecule in the body, and it's also involved in the immune system. And it appears that for people over the age of 60, the elderly are more vulnerable to getting infections like pneumonia that might, you know, might result in their death. It appears high cholesterol is protective for those people. 
So really, I, I really think we need to stop fearing cholesterol. There is a asso very strong association, extremely high cholesterol levels, um, something called familial hyperlipidemia. But even within those, a significant proportion of them who are not treated will have normal lifespans. So I think really we need to f forget about this obsession with cholesterol, to be honest. Okay. Uh, I'd actually agree, uh, uh, agree with us. Most of the cholesterol that, uh, in our body is made in the body and not how the amount of, small amount that you eat. You haven't got to worry about the diet. And it's used, as you said, to do, build your membranes and your cells to make your bioacids and everything. And the amount in the blood depends very much on whether the liver clears at a different rate compared to other people. Unfortunately, it's a very simple hypothesis. This cholesterol in the plaques inside your blood vessels cholesterol in your blood, it must be really very bad. It's much more complex than that, and unfortunately, as seam has shown, it's a proxy. People thought that it meant cardiovascular cholesterol, but it probably doesn't. It's been a false hearing, really. Okay, yes, thank you. Okay, uh, my point is, yeah, the literature on the fact panel, and the literature on the fact panel. I just want to quickly uh, pick up, if I may, on this thing of a, a sugar tax, or sort of a soda tax. Uh, because one of the issues that I think you may have with a solar tax um, is if people find the solar is too expensive, wouldn't they just shift to another sugar, high sugar option if the solar is too expensive? Uh, I'm just curious what the panel thinks about um, the sugar taxes if they're introduced to our legislation. Presumably people may just say, well, an unintended consequence of the legislation is that they just look for sugar in another source from something that isn't socially taxed. Um, I'll, I'll just answer briefly from my experience of this and then I'll pass on to the, the panel, but um, I think the, the um, soda industry were given quite a bit of notice that this was going to be happening. And so you'll find that a lot of the uh, drinks companies have changed the formulas of their drinks and reduced the, the amount of sugar within the drinks already before the tax kicked in. So there, there is an element of how, that's, that's evidence of how the tax has actually changed the big food industry and what they were doing. You know, they were never going to change that formula and reduce the amount of sugar until suddenly they were, their customers were going to have to start paying more tax for it. But um, if, if there's anybody in the panel, yeah? Sorry, do you want to go yeah, ahead? Go ahead, yeah, go okay. ahead. No, you're absolutely right. There is a worry about it. It's the same way that some people argued against stopping smoking because it affected the people, the uh, poorer people who smoked, one of the ministers in uh, the, the UK said. It's a perfect logical argument. If you produce a minimum unit price for alcohol, it affects people at the poor end who are drinking far too much and very heavily and lying on the streets. This, the evidence we have so far worldwide is when they've done that elsewhere, as in Mexico, it did reduce the amount of sugar that was taken in. So although you're quite right, it's, it's, it, it's a loose sort of way of doing it. Nevertheless, uh, the evidence at the moment is that it will have an effect. Yeah. It's, it's probably because soda is a particularly easy way to pour in lots and lots of sugar. I mean, it's, um, uh, that's probably the reason why it works, but I totally agree with you that uh, you run the risk that people start eating other things. Anybody else? No? Yes, a question over there. Um, I a quick question really, it's a just a general health question. Um, I've done a couple of um, medium term fasts and I just wanted to get your thoughts and your expertise on intermittent fasting or, or maybe five day fasting or anything longer. Oh, five, two, day, um, what are your thoughts on that? Is it health benefits? Um, I'm having an experience myself and just doing a bit of research, just going to get your thoughts as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, a, a very uh, good question. I think um, uh, there is lots and lots of scientific data in, in animals that intermittent periodic or intermittent fasting is actually very good for health. It uh, extends lifespan um, without virtually without exception and it prevents uh, the development of diabetes, of, 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 of um, vascular disease and we know um, more and more about the mechanisms actually that work um, um, that work there and so there, there's there's very few data in humans yet but um, I think 
given the, the fact that the, the mechanisms involved, the molecular mechanisms involved, are evolutionary, strongly conserved, that I, I would personally would be very surprised if it wouldn't work in humans. Mm -hmm. In fact, um, we're, we're going to do a, a study in, in patients with type 2 diabetes where we have them, um, modif have them um, modified fast for five days a month during one year and we expect to, to see really, really profound metabolic changes. Um, so, um, I, I, as to, to summarize, I, I really think that this is a very promising uh, approach to improve health for many people. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, the Newcastle diet in, um, I think it was the University of Newcastle, did some research into this and they actually reversed diabetes in 10 out of 12 of the people who um, participated by reducing the calorie intake between 600 and 800 calories a day, something like that. Yeah. So, um, so. Yeah. This is quite briefly, but my knowledge of it as well as regarding the diabetes is for your gut microflora and it just allows it to regenerate after 16 hours of allowing the gut to have a rest of food. It allows the natural gut microbiomes in there to flourish. So there's some like, good evidence regarding the gut health side of it as well, which is sort of quite supported at the moment, which I think where we are currently surrounded by food all the time and we're currently grazing, it is quite nice to allow your stomach to have a 16-hour rest from time to time once a week. Okay, we have time for just one more question. The lady there. I'd like to make a comment about cholesterol and ask one question, a simple question. I mean, it seemed obvious when you were talking about cholesterol and the fact that it was being reduced in this way. Yeah. But it's not that the cholesterol issue could not be is it this, sorry. It seemed obvious for decades that cholesterol could be not was not that important because of the data from France. I mean, if cholesterol was as important as we said it was, why wasn't all of why weren't the French dying if they yeah. all had high cholesterol? Yeah. But anyway, my question to a scientific panel. Um, I'd like to know what you think about the connection with cooking. I mean, it does seem to me that the spread of highly processed food has gone hand in hand with the decline of cooking. Mm. And we live in a society in the UK where food has been seen as trivial and the work of women and so on. And we've Scientists and uh, medics have, in general, thought it was unimportant. I wonder what you all think. Um, Sheila, it's a great question, and uh, I think the uh, even the understanding amongst the medical profession, I can definitely tell you that the um, understanding until recently, and it's growing now, uh, of the importance of food was was un completely unimportant. The fact that we are serving poorly nutritious food and junk food to patients in hospital clearly shows there's a complete disconnect about the, you know, and a lot of these hospitals don't have fresh food on site, they bring it in, it's processed, it's in a package. Um, so I think that there, there has been a, a lack of uh, understanding and awareness, I mean, for general public as well. Um, what I find, I'm, I'm not going to ask you a question back, but what I find really interesting and puzzling is when, when even uh, in the UK, I'm sure in the same in Europe and abroad, Cooking programs seem to be the most popular. So people seem to like watching people cook, but they don't do it themselves. And I just don't, I don't understand that. I really don't get that. For your reason. <laughs> yeah. I remember going to a lecture a few years ago by Sir John Krebs in the, the UK, and he put up a graph showing the average time spent cooking the evening meal had gone down to 10 minutes. In fact, it would be zero in a few years' time, he said. So I think it's part of societal change that they don't want to spend the time and therefore you end up getting these very unhealthy foods because they're easy to throw into the what's it well, rather than making the, the stews and the soups and things like that. I, I would suggest, but you'd know better than I would. Well, I think it's quite interesting what Asim said, that you've got this sort of pornography of mm. television programmes and I think that has put people off cooking because they think they have to produce something for <laughs> mm. instead of having a lamb chopped salad. Point. So the things go hand in hand. I think the other thing to mention, just with society and the way we function at the moment as well, I think there's also, we've lost, so my understanding still, I don't know if there's French people here, but the French still value their lunch hour and they have time where they sit down at a table and they will eat their lunch. In many other Western countries, people, I think in the UK, the average time people spend having something like 12 minutes or something ridiculous like that. 
So I think there's something there that we need to learn and think back to our roots on. Yeah, let's go. go ahead. If I may just add a little Can you use the microphone there? But I write um, cookbooks which, uh, with recipes that you can make in only 15 minutes and it's an increasing success and you just, yeah, everybody loves it. Just, it's, it's, you can cook in only 10 min minutes really nice. Hmm. Okay. So we will change. But in the UK it's got to be within 10 minutes, otherwise people <laughs> will <laughs> we'll start there. <laughs> And that 10 minutes included eating it. Um, thank you very much to our panel. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to everybody at home who watched this on the live stream. Please remember to share it. And um, let's make a difference. Thank you. Very good. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.